Good morning and welcome to Iowa Ideas. Today we will be discussing school attendance and classroom behavior. My name is Grace King and I'm the K-12 education reporter at the Gazette. I wanna thank our Iowa Ideas presenting sponsor, ITC Midwest. Our panelists today are Johnson County Attorney, Rachel Zimmerman Smith, Stacy Cole, Superintendent of the Storm Lake Community School District, Dr. Aaron Slater, Superintendent of the Fort Madison Community School District, and Laura Medbury, Executive Director of, for, of Learning Supports for the College Community School District. So thank you all for being here today. I appreciate it. Um, let's start by talking about uh, challenges that you guys have seen in your own schools in terms of school attendance. Um, has this changed since the pandemic began? Um, are, you, are you seeing it get better at all? Uh, Laura, would you mind starting us off? Sure, I'll start. Uh, we definitely did see an increase in the percentage of chronic absenteeism after the pandemic occurred. And we have been recovering since then. We actually, at College Community anyway, started focusing on our rates of chronic absenteeism about two years before the pandemic. Uh, that was because there was a citywide effort led by United Way of focusing on attendance through the, an organization called Attendance Works. So we were starting to look at that and felt that the rates were too high then. And then the pandemic hit and then they really spiked. Um, in particular, of course, during the years where we were quarantining and isolating per public health guidance, but even when we were no longer doing that, we definitely saw an increase as compared to pre-pandemic levels. And I'm you know, happy to say that we have seen uh, improvement in this area, but it is not established as it was prior to the pandemic. And, um, and just to reiterate, it still felt like it was a little high before the pandemic. So we definitely have a lot of work to do, but we are, we're kind of in recovery mode, which is a good thing. Can you explain what chronic absenteeism means, Laura? Sure. So chronic absenteeism by federal definition is 10% of absence for any reason. And so a student becomes chronically absent when they miss 10% of school time for any reason. This varies a little bit between what the um, Senate file 2435 in Iowa, how the state of Iowa has defined chronic absenteeism for us. Because in that definition, um, there's a rate of 10% chronic absenteeism, a rate of 15% chronic absenteeism. And within that legislation, there's also a handful of exemptions that would not, uh, what shall I say, calculate in that measure. Mm -hmm. And that, that is out of alignment with the federal definition. So now we're kind of working with two definitions in Iowa schools. Okay. Yeah, Erin, uh, Stacy, what have you seen in, in your schools when it comes to attendance challenges? Mm -hmm. Go for it. Yeah, Aaron. Oh, sorry. All right. Hey, um, thanks everybody for joining. I would agree with what Laura has stated. Um, in my opinion, and probably the opinion of the panel, any absenteeism among students is too much. Um, we know how valuable education is and learning takes place during the school day that any absence, whether you're categorizing it as true and draconic, um, in, in our opinion, my opinion is too much. So. Even before the pandemic, we were working on strategies to make connections with families so that students felt comfortable coming to school and felt welcoming there, felt engaged. Um, we have a truancy officer um, full time in our district, uh, and that has really helped have an extra set of resources uh, to reach out to families, uh, provide transportation at times when um, that's become a critical area for some of our families to be able to access education. So again, I would agree with everything that Laura said, but it's something that we've worked on at all times. Um, have we seen it, uh, chronic absenteeism and, and truancy increase since the pandemic? Yes, uh, we just have to make sure that we're putting in as much effort as we possibly can to reduce any absenteeism among our students. I, I would also echo everything that Laura said, including we were also starting to work on our rates prior to the pandemic because ours also were um, way too high for our liking prior to the pandemic. And then um, we just saw the pandemic really take a hit on the already too high rates that we had. 
Um, we were really lucky. We've been working with our county attorney really, really closely for the last school year. So prior to the new law going into place, we started working um, with her a lot on what we could do. And our focus really has been um, our youngest students because we know by the time they establish habits um, that it might be too late to redo those. So we have been working really, really closely with our school attorney for the last school year. And I'm proud to say that all that hard work has paid off and our rates at kindergarten and first grade are lower than the state average. And so the work has paid off. Um, that being said, I think um, to what Laura spoke to um, earlier and to Erin saying she has a full-time person devoted to it, it takes a lot of work and it definitely takes a partnership in order to see results because what we were seeing prior to the partnership with our county attorney is that we just weren't seeing the results and whether it was a, a, a parenting thing, whether it was a kid thing, it didn't really matter. And until um, we had that partnership in the community, we just weren't seeing the results that we're seeing um, now and we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, Rachel, could you talk about that from, from your view from the Johnson County Attorney's Office? Just about the relationships? Um, what? Yeah, what are you seeing in terms of absenteeism in schools and, and how do you work with schools? Um, well, I think Johnson County is like all of um, the school folks said, it's, it's, it's actually, an, there are national trends also. Iowa is not unique in that way, unfortunately for all of us. Um, but we've been working with uh, the school district here sort of in the same way that Stacy just described, um, because it is a, it's a community issue, not just a school issue. And county attorneys are by statute supposed to play a part um, in, in making sure that um, kids are in school. So we have a what we call a diversion program here in Johnson County. They have one in Lynn County to the north of us as well. Um, and our office um, meets with parents, with a judge. Um, and works with the school to to make sure that the, the kids are in school. That's our number one goal. Um, and we don't want to use the punitive measures that are in the statute, if at all possible. That's not, I, I could think I could speak for my fellow county attorneys um, across the state that that is really not our goal um, with these compulsory, compulsory attendance um, procedures. We really just want to get kids in school. So we work with the kids and the parents um, to just sort of remind them that it's actually a legal responsibility to have your kid in school and how can we help you. And I've found um, here in Johnson County, we have several school districts and I'm sure it's the same across the state. Uh, we're always, I'm always amazed when I go to some of these meetings with schools and parents of what length schools will go to to get kids um, in the door, to work them into being comfortable in school. And, and schools are really from what we're seeing here, doing their best um, to get kids in school and learning. Uh, yeah, I want to remind our audience we are taking questions, so please pop those into the chat. Um, but let's talk about that new attendance law and how it's being implemented in, in each of your school districts. Do you want me? Well, I can just sort of explain. Sure, Rachel, go ahead. The, yeah, the new law really puts... Uh, more, it's really about what the schools have to do and gives the schools more responsibility and actually some more expense. I think part of the new rule requires the sending of certified mail letters to parents, which uh, in a large school district can cost tens of thousands of dollars. And in a smaller school district, probably the same. It's it's could be a budget buster. So there are some new requirements in that statute that put a lot of pressure on schools it really hasn't changed the county attorney's duties um, at all. Just kind of where we come into the process has changed a little bit. So I think it really has impacted schools much more than it would a county attorney's. Stacy, talk about what that looks like in your district. So in our district, we're, um, we're a little unique. We're a small rural area of the state, but we have quite a diverse population. So we're about 87% um, students of color in our district, and most of those students are immigrants and refugees. And so the certified male piece does add an interesting component. Uh, even though I know our county attorney worked closely with the writing of this legislation, and I know that she talked about ways that we were able to do that. Um, 
in all honesty, there are, we have a very transient population. And so um, oftentimes the address that we have on file isn't the current address by the time um, we get to the point where we're sending the certified mail. And so we do a lot of hand delivering of the mail and having uh, parents sign it with us at the door because um, if we deliver, if we send the certified mail to the original address, then it comes back to us and we spend a lot of time and a lot of resources redoing that. Um, for instance, we have a kiddo that um, I think last week I was told he'd already missed 17 full days of school, um, but we're unable to find him right now. And so to send a certified letter to him is actually impossible because even in our home visits, we haven't been able to find him or his family. And so right now the challenge behind the scenes to uh, is, you know, to the point of schools are using creative ways is calling other communities that are near us to see like, is he living actually there? And we haven't found him yet because he's planning on coming back. And so um, it's much larger than maybe what the legislation just like even looks like, you know, like, when you look at it, it looks pretty simple, right? You send a letter at, or you call it X number of days and then you send the first letter and then you send the certified letter. And it actually takes a very intentional effort behind the scenes to make sure that all of the pieces are in place um, so that hopefully we get something happening before the punitive piece, like we've talked mm -hmm. about before, because none of us, and you know, including the county attorneys, none of us want that to be, we don't want the teeth of it to have to be the piece that you go right after. But that being said, um, I appreciate that there is some teeth to the legislation so that once we if if we're spending all of this time, money, all of the resources that we're spending, it is nice to have like if the things aren't done, that there is something else that can be done that's beyond the school. It's nice to be in that partnership with the community in the state. Stacey, you also had a, a different approach maybe than some other school districts regarding student illness. Can you talk about that? So we do have quite a few um, underinsured students in our school district. So one of the things that we work really, really hard on is having our social workers work with our families and help them access insurance. Um, for a lot of reasons, that all doesn't always happen. And so we will have students that are underinsured or don't have any insurance at all. And so one of the pieces of the state legislation, so the truancy part, not the chronic absence, not the federal piece with chronic absenteeism, but the state piece with um, allowing for some medical exemptions, we don't want to put families into any sort of hardship. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're utilizing our school nurses um, not in lieu of a doctor, but if a parent is like, look, my kid really is sick and I don't want to be in trouble with the county attorney, then we are utilizing our school nurses. And I think I think college community might be doing something similar. Um, and so we're utilizing that as a method so that parents aren't further punished for living in poverty, because we know that a lot of, a lot of times laws impact people who live in poverty differently than they impact someone like me that has the resources to go and do the things. And so we want to make sure that we're um, using very equitable practices as we support our families and getting their students to school. Because the bottom line is, is that we want to have a good relationship with them. We want their kids to want to come to school. We don't want them to come to school with us dragging them in the door. We want them to come because we fixed the issue behind the scenes. And so that's one of the ways that we're trying to work with our families so that they see this as a safety net of support. Mm -hmm. um, we, we sometimes find with some of our families that they're embarrassed about the reason that their student doesn't want to come to school. So um, another part of the pandemic is that, um, like, I don't know anyone else on this, but we're seeing a lot of kids who just simply aren't ready for kindergarten. And what I mean by that is we have higher numbers of kindergartners this year. I mean, in fact, the fact that I even have to have to say higher, but that are, that are not potty trained. So they're sending their kids to school in kindergarten who are not potty trained. And I'm talking teens of kids. So we have about 200 kids and typically in a class in our in our school district and teens are not coming potty trained to school. And what we're finding is, is that the parents are embarrassed by the fact that they've been unable to potty train them. And so they're not sending the kids to school because they're embarrassed by the fact that they couldn't do that. Well, we're having to find inroads with that and find those springboards of ideas to help parents understand, hey, we're not here to, to get you. 
but we do want your kids potty trained before kindergarten. So let's talk about that and let's not make the strategy of avoiding preschool and avoiding school. Let's make the strategy, we'll come in, we'll help you, we'll give you that safety net of support in a non-judgmental way so that you can make sure that your kid is ready to go when they come to kindergarten and then we don't have other issues that come from that. Yeah, yeah, it can start so young that school avoidance behavior and um, it's really hard to catch up after that. Yes. Laura, can you talk about Prairie and, and what this law looks like um, in your school district? Sure. So one of the differences I maybe could start with that with that mm -hmm. um, schools do have some local decision making and how they code certain things and whether or not certain examples of absence could be exempt under the law or not. So uh, as Stacy was describing Storm Lake, one, one point I can say is different at Prairie is initially we don't require additional documentation from the doctor or verification from the student nurse in order to qualify an absence as exempt in Iowa law. Um, we would just hear from the parent saying that their child is sick and for whatever reason. And then our plan is on the back end, and we actually just did this yesterday, is to look at uh, various <clears throat> rates of those, they call MedEx is kind of the code that we use in the schools, um, of MedEx absences. And if we have a student that seems to develop a certain um, pattern that's concerning, working with the family and then maybe going forward requiring that documentation, or another route to go would be, as Stacy was talking about, if if there isn't access to health care, um, then util utilizing the school nurse to make that decision. So the reason this local control is really important, um, as you were listening to Stacy talk about the demographic makeup and the needs of Storm Lake schools are different than the demographic makeup, the needs of college community schools. So I think we've appreciated having a little bit of flexibility and being able to see how does our community respond to these policies each year and then how might we modify them? And then can we see differences in the data? Do we get better results when we modify our policies in a certain way? Yeah. I jump in. I really appreciate Laura saying what she said because one of the things that we notice is that in our school district, one of the things we need we need to do as a school district is help our families access healthcare because in a lot of cases, healthcare doesn't look the same in the country where they came from as it looks in Iowa. And so there's a completely different level of healthcare available in Iowa. And so in Laura's case, where her families know how to access that, they know it's available, they know for our families, there's a lot of hidden rules with it, with accessing healthcare in, in preventative ways um, to ensure one of the issues that we have as a community is that a lot of, a lot of our population uses the ER as a primary physician place. And so we have to help our ER actually be an ER. And in order to do that, we have to educate our families differently than Laura. So I too appreciate that because it is a completely different game that we're trying to play with families. And so that, that flexibility and how we go about that, both with our county attorneys and through the legislation is really, really appreciated because we all are very, very different regardless of what makes us different. Yeah. You know, and since this is kind of the Iowa Ideas Conference, I want to just mention that what might be like more of a tier three approach at College Community sounds like it might be more of a tier one approach at Storm Lake. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think our communities maybe could both benefit from is having providers around the table because we too see this increase in students not ready for kindergarten in terms of just basic self-care such as toileting. And when we get together as um, urban education network across the state, which would be about 18 larger school districts in Iowa, I sit on that health services team and hear from the school nurses about how significant of an issue this is becoming in our area. And so how could we bring Bring our pediatric care providers around the table, our um, first five providers, hey cap, around the table to talk about what we're seeing in schools in terms of readiness and how we might be able to support our students better and also deliver messages at a very young age about the importance of preschool and K-12 school attendance so that the, our families are hearing those messages from the moment when their children are very, very young and not, not yet school age. The bin. I, I agree with what Stacy and Laura have said, especially when I think what you're hearing is the balance and the push and pull that we are dealing with with compliance 
um, as it relates to federal law and state law, but yet what's happening behind that to make sure that we're being compliant and all of the, the time, effort and resources we're trying to do to make sure that, I mean, our goal ultimately is to have kids in school, compliance, no compliance, federal guidance, whatever. Our goal is to have kids in school, whether we have that hanging over our head or not. Um, what's happened is that now that is hanging over our head when you talk about federal law and, and Iowa law and then the, our chronic um, absenteeism and our truancy rate is something that's going to determine the rating of our school districts as it relates to the Iowa performance profile. And you can hear just with three school districts on this call that we're very different school districts. Um, we have some similar approaches, but some of us have to put resources in other areas because of our demographics or poverty rate or what have you. So that's where it gets complicated. So I would um, concur with Laura that when legislation is coming out, it would help have some of those boots on the ground people as part of the guidance so that they're thinking about how this affects real people, not just the black and white that's on the paper, but how this affects real families and school districts who ultimately, as I said before, we all have the same goal. We want our kids in school. We want them to be healthy and happy. We want them to be safe. We want families to feel like they belong. And so we'll continue to do that whether there's something hanging over our head or not. So how we have to look at these families that that spill out into chronic absenteeism and truancy, they are our tier three families. Um, they're, they're usually tier three academically. They're usually tier three for behavior supports that are needed. So we have to look at those resources and provide above and beyond. And so you've heard some examples of how Stacy and Laura are doing that. We have a community support specialist that we've hired through Four Oaks out of Cedar Rapids um, that really works with those tier three families to try to get them help and support with um, health care, uh, paying their bills, access to Alliant Energy, some of those basic needs that are getting in the way of what we say, why aren't you coming to school? So again, we we have the ultimate goal in mind. It's just how you have to approach it um, when you have that, that compliance piece as well. Yeah, thank you, Erin. Um, could we talk a little bit more about the importance of, of regular attendance? Um, do you feel like families maybe fell out of that habit when um, we were staggering school, uh, learning from home during the pandemic, and, and why is it important to be in school in person? Though it is important to be in person, that's where the learning is. But I think some families saw that it was accomplished, maybe not in a, in a great way when we were virtual or when we were in hybrid and every school district dealt with that differently. Uh, I think that they saw, well, they could jump on the computer and catch up, or they could jump on the computer and learn, or they could go every other week or whatever that hybrid situation looked like. So then that became a habit, back to what Stacey was saying about how habits are formed. So that kind of became a habit. So then now we're back in person 100% of the time, and some families are like, well, we didn't have to do that necessarily during the pandemic, so why do we have to do it now? And some of those early learners, when the, those habits were being formed, um, weren't the same as what the expectation is and what we know is best practice. No. Yeah. I'll jump on and add, I think one of the pieces of this too that we can provide as school districts is thinking about the value add that we provide to the community and to the state. So what I mean by that is I think it's really important that we think about when I went to school, the value add that school gave was knowledge. I went to school to return home with more knowledge than I had when mm -hmm. I went. Today, kids can get knowledge, whether misinformation knowledge or, you know, like knowledge, right, whatever it is, right, but they can get knowledge from home. And that's what we saw during the pandemic was a lot more people were like, gosh, they can get what I got from school virtually. So I think one of the things that we also have to think about as a state, and to Laura's point earlier, this is Iowa ideas, right, is, is how do we look at school and the value add being the social and the community piece that we add as a school that they can't get playing Fortnite at home, doing an online class at home, because kids are connecting virtually, but they're not getting that true connection, that human connection that they really need. And so thinking about really promoting that 
schools provide that human connection that we really do need to function well in society. I mean, my social media feed would indicate that we do need some education on this as a, as a nation, right? That like we could use some human connection and some ideas about how to disagree with a with an idea and not the person giving the idea. And I think that's the piece that we can provide in schools that kids can't get anywhere else. And so it's helping parents see why it's so important that they come and that they're not just online doing an online academy. What is it that we can give them at school? And um, even thinking about, um, you know, it, let's say if someone says, you know, my child was bullied and I, they don't want to come to school. Well, let's talk about how to work through that. Let's teach your child how to work through those bad experiences, because this is where we provide that safety net of learning that if they don't learn that in K-12 education, they're, they're not going to learn it very easily after K-12. So there are some like new ways to think about school and what we provide to kids and their families that we might need to promote a little bit more. We have a question. Yeah. Go ahead, Sorry. Rachel. No, no. So I was just going to say, um, I think from a, you know, as a, a member of law enforcement and just somebody who's concerned with community safety, um, both at the individual level and the larger level, I just think in-person attendance at school um, is critical to the safety of those individual kids, um, many of whom, if they're small and they're not, if they're not in an age where they can self-protect and they're not coming to school, um, that can be a sign that something, it's not always a sign, I'm not saying that, but school is a place where they catch kids who are in trouble and families who need help. And so if a kid's coming to school, um, you know, not with enough food or with, you know, all of that stuff, uh, teachers and school staff really um, are have a bigger uh, responsibilities, um, fortunately or not. Um, that they're providing for those interventions for kids or at least letting somebody know that they're there. So at an individual level, it protects the, that kid and that family if they're coming to school. And then as a community level, um, like Stacy was saying, I just think um, that's where kids learn to be citizens and learn about um, being a member of a community, which Fortnite is not being a member of our community. I there are people in my house who love Fortnite, but it's not teaching them um, to be good citizens and participate in our community and our democracy. So um, these ladies have a huge responsibility <laughs> um, as educators. And I think coming to school in person really provides for that more than anything anybody's going to read um, online or virtually. Yeah. And I, I think about the ways that students get to explore um, possible careers, too, and, and how that really just leads into their entire future. We have a question from our audience here. Um, some would say school days are too long, leading to burnout, especially with kids having to go to daycare before and after school. That's up to 10 hours away from home and family each day. Isn't family connection central to their emotional well-being? So I guess, how do you balance that with um, school attendance? Yeah, my, and my initial, hard my initial <laughs> it really is. And my initial reaction is I sometimes feel like the school day is too short in order to get in all <laughs> of the things that are required. So that one... Um, that's what, that's what my initial reaction was, but I, I could not agree more uh, that the family connection is so, so critical and, you know, it probably could get into a lot of different ideas of how are we as a society making sure that families can, you know, earn a living wage and work regular hours so that when students are in school, parents are at work and when students are at home, parents can, um, you know, be there for their families. That would be a dream for every one of the kids that I work with. Um, but I, I just, I can't agree more that that the family connection is absolutely critical to the students' overall well-being, academic, socially, um, academically, behaviorally, just every, absolutely every aspect. I don't know how to fix that. I don't know how to fix it when a student spends, you know, a couple hours before school at daycare and an hour or two after school daycare, much respect to the families that are making that all work. Um, but yeah, I think that question is pretty big. And I, I, yeah, like, again, I would have a dream for all of our kids to be able to have that 
family time every day because I had that as a kid and boy, it's irreplaceable. Yeah, and I think that's something I noted just my kids are a little bit older, but, um, you know, most, a lot of families, the school is their daycare, right? And so when you took away, like during the pandemic, when families couldn't go to work, like I think the the issue with, we're lucky if they do have good quality daycare and childcare in the state of Iowa. Um, and I, you know, unfortunately, I think that's not the case. I think there actually needs to be more options. Um mm -hmm. for that to support families, because a lot of families are using school as a childcare, which it is, but there needs to be good childcare for um, kids who aren't school age too, so. Yeah, and I would just add that, oh, go ahead, Erin, go ahead. Well, sorry, Steve. I would just say that that's, that's the struggle, right, is um, what's happening with kids when they're not with us at school. Um, are they home with their families and their families are there? Are they home and they're taking care of siblings because mom and or dad or grandpa, grandma, they're out working second shift, third shift, multiple jobs to put food on the table. Uh, we've established both before school and after school care because we felt that that was a great alternative for families who couldn't be together um, during the non-school time hours. So it, it, it's it's a Band-Aid, but, you know, and, and looking at some of the state reporting for Iowa, the, the area um, in Southeast Iowa, where my district is, has been referred to as a child care desert. There are not enough child care options and spots for the families who would need it in order to be able to work at a level to provide for their families. So when you talk about rural and you talk about poverty, as Stacey talked about before, those are very hard barriers and challenges that we as a school district try to overcome and compensate for. So we're, we feel really, I mean, the number of families, have, I think 150 families the first year that access before school and after school. Would we rather have them at home with their family and doing family things like maybe some of us experienced? Absolutely. But this was um, a next best option, I guess. So um, it is a challenging question. I appreciate the question. And I think we're all open to whatever we can do to provide for our kids when they're not technically in school. And I would just add that when I, when I read about burnout or when I study the term burnout, it's often referenced into, you know, I'm forced to do something that I don't love to do. And that's what makes me burn out is that, you know, like I think about like my, my position, I love my position. I love my kids in the school district. So I don't get burnt out because I love, it's not, I'm, it's not a job. It's what I love to do. Right. It, it actually fulfills my life versus burns me out. So I think about how, how we could think um, even broader about what that means for kids and how do we bring back some joy? We spend a lot of time in schools meeting compliance things, whether we're talking about attendance, whether we're talking about reading our math, there's a lot of compliance that drives what happens in schools. And I think at an Iowa ideas conference, it would be a great time to talk about how kids need recess and how kids need free time and how, you know, if you read the book, the anxious generation, that those researchers talk a lot about the fact that kids need time to develop those skills of how to get along without an adult intervening. And there's so much that's happening in our kids' worlds today that do not help them fulfill that challenge. And then, then consequently don't help them learn to be the adults that we are going to need them to be later. And so I think it's an and both approach, right? It's thinking about what can happen differently at school that helps kids love school so it doesn't feel like burnout. It doesn't feel like now I'm going to one more thing. It's, oh, I get to go there. I love there. We really expanded summer school since the pandemic because we just wanted kids to be able to come and enjoy each other and have that sense of community. And I'll have parents start texting me in March and saying, are you going to do summer school the same way again? Because boy, my kids love summer school. And I think how sad is it that I can't provide some of those summer school things that they love in the school year because we're so mm -hmm. compliance driven that we don't have time. And then additionally, I would just add that the reason that we have all that wraparound care to Laura's point is because our parents can't, they, they don't have the privilege of having jobs that pay them a living wage that allow them to work sort of regular hours for lack of better way of saying that. And so the other thing that we try to do is really think about that from a value add perspective of what can the school offer the family. I have a lot of third shift families, which means that they come home at 8.30 or nine in the morning. So they don't get to see their kids before school. And then they're sleeping until probably eight, 8.30 at night. So about the time their kids are going
going to bed, they're getting up to work that third shift. So what can we provide during the day that allows parents to have access to their kids if there is that need for wraparound services before and after school, because that parent connection, that family connection is vital to the success of all of our kids. And just because it doesn't work in their schedule doesn't mean that we can't work with them to think about how we help provide that. So I think like from a Iowa Ideas perspective, we really need to evaluate in our state, you know, what is the value of school? Why do we provide school? How does that ebb and flow with families? And how do we need to to dream and imagine things differently so that we really can start to meet the needs of our communities so that we're not fighting absenteeism rates because kids don't want to come to school? You know, like that is a part of it and we need to acknowledge it. But part of that is driven by policies and compliance that we don't have any control of um, at the school level. I feel like there's so many threads we could follow there that aren't necessarily a part of this conversation, like maybe the year round school model, um, how that could create flexibility for families and kids. But I want to pivot a little bit and talk about student behavior um, in the classroom. I I, I think, Stacey, you were talking a little bit about this, too, about how kids need some downtime, recess time, time to be kids. So what does it mean when a student exhibits behavior? Let's kind of define what that means first. Laura, I think you did a great job with this when we were chatting the other day. Do you want to start it? I, you oh, did a great sure. Job. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think when we say students exhibit behavior, it really should be a value. It should be a neutral term, but it, it isn't. Usually when somebody says a student's exhibiting behavior, um, it's loud, it's disruptive, it might even be violent. And it it gets a lot of attention and concern as it should, both because that's a signal that something's not going quite right for the student mentally or internally, physiologically. And also it can be very disruptive for the students in the classroom. And so I I just mentioned it, it should be neutral, but but it's really not. It's when the behavior that gets the most attention in schools right now is those situations where for whatever reason, a student is kind of on edge and they have an experience within the classroom, within the home, on the bus, at recess, that kind of sets off their nervous system and makes them feel a little bit out of control. We do also see in schools internalizing behavior that gets less attention, but we see students that might withdraw Mm-hmm. And they might, um, you know, change their friend group, exhibit a change in behavior. We'd be, of course, worried about them for signs of an early development of some type of mental illness. But those externalizing factors, as well as the internalizing, can lead to some attendance issues. So students begin to withdraw, and then they slowly withdraw from um, other activities that they're either uh, previously enjoyed or that they've previously been expected to do, and for whatever reason, can no longer feel like they can do those. I want to um, remind our audience, please uh, put your questions in the chat. We have about 20 minutes left. So um, how have you guys seen student behavior change in recent years? Um, We hear stories about escalating behavior. You know, this is leading to teacher burnout, that sort of thing. But but what is really behind this? So I think Laura did a a great job in just kind of capturing behavior in general. have we seen an escalation in um, behavior? Again, trying to use it as a neutral term, but uh, to Laura's point, it's not. Um, Yes, we have. And so we try to put resources in place to support students. But if you think about what behavior is, all behavior, whether it's positive or negative or challenging, it's communication. That child is trying to communicate something. They might not be doing it in a way that we want them to do it or where what we deem is appropriate, but all, all behavior is communication. We really work on trying to get to the root cause. Why is this behavior happening? Why, you know, what, what is happening in your life that is causing you to, to this way? And so before um, some of those behaviors came, became so challenging, we could use what we refer to obviously in, in education as tier one, you know, positive reinforce, making sure we're being proactive. Um, But we're almost to the point where we look at what do we do for tier two, like a check in, check out, making positive connections to each kid each day. Um, Those are things that maybe we would do prior to the pandemic to try to make sure to head off any positive, negative behavior. And we're finding that we're employing tier two and tier three connections in tier one to all kids. 
because we're just feeling like we want to make sure that kids are regulated, that again, they're feeling safe, they're feeling like they can communicate with us and try to communicate in a way that's not negative. Um, but uh, all too many times we do have kids that are communicating. We need to get to that root cause. Why are they acting out in this manner and try to get to a problem solving state and not a, um, a reactive state? Yeah, yeah, or a punitive state. Mm -hmm. At College Community, we last year we trained our paraprofessionals and our teachers across two different experiences, but district wide on uh, the impact of toxic stress. So students repeatedly having stressful situations, but not being able to come down from those. And so over time, they compound and they kind of live in an escalated um, emotional state. Also, just the rise of mental illness. We know that the numbers of mental illness have increased dramatically. Um, they were on the rise before the pandemic, and then that really escalated things. And then the third component that we talk about is device addiction. So students who um, are busy parents who have uh, limited time um, to be able to navigate situations, um, keep their kids entertained and like keep them calm and that type of thing. So you can see it in any restaurant or on a plane or anything like that in order to call a, ch a young child. Sometimes it's an iPad or a phone. I was lucky. My kids are old enough. I, we didn't have that when they were little so much. Um, but what we know is that students um, less and less are learning the ability to self-soothe because a, a device just distracts. But if you don't have that distraction, you kind of, uh, as a very, very, very young child, we're talking birth to three, you learn to self-soothe. So I'm feeling this, this feeling and what are the things that I can do in order to soothe myself. But devices have kind of impacted us in terms of a student regulating or a child regulating that without the distraction of a screen. And since we've sort of like um, talked a lot about community partnerships and thinking about that, one thing that I think that as we think about what Iowa can do, right, as we think about the large number of kids that are dysregulated in schools, and to Laura's point that kids are learning to self-soothe from birth to three, and to Rachel's point that we don't have a lot of eyes on kids from birth to three, I think one thing that we can do as a state is really look at enhancing the level of support that we give parents for kids and that have kids ages zero to three. And so that's really looking at our HHS system and thinking about our parents getting what they need to help their own kids learn to self-soothe. Because I think that's one of the things that we're seeing. We all know early intervention is what will help all of this get better. And so as a state, what are we doing to ensure that parents of kids in those critical ages? So I know like when school shut down for the pandemic, I really thought about who were our cohorts of kids that needed more? So for us, I really thought about those kids in grades K2, like those learning to read ages. What were we going to do when we came back from the pandemic to ensure that those kids got something different? How about our kids in algebra class? Like algebra is really important if you're going to be really successful in college and beyond, if you're not going to get, um, if a car dealership isn't going to, you know, mess with your finances, you know, how do we make sure that those things are happening? And I think our birth to age three is a critical age right now where we're seeing um, kids kids needs, needs not being met. And we really need to think about that as a state. What are the early intervention tools that we can provide at that level? Because like Laura said, we're seeing astronomical numbers of kids that are dealing with mental health components later. And perhaps we need to look at early intervention and think about how we can prevent that so that we don't continue to see that if we're helping parents with kids birth ages zero to three, we're going to see less and less of these other things. And so as a state, is it time for us to think about what are the wraparound services that are given to families that have kids zero to three that could maybe work from a preventative state so that we're not sitting on Zooms like this, talking about how we're reacting to all the negative things that happen when kids aren't taught to regulate in those critical years. What does that support look like um, for the families when kids get do get into school and, and are um, showing challenging behaviors in the classroom? So I can talk about um, what we've done for the past couple of years in, in Fort Madison is we've established um, restorative classrooms, um, both at the elementary building and at the junior, senior high as a um, 
response mechanism for students that are not regulated in their classroom. And so having the opportunity for them to take a break, um, whether it's walk down to the restorative classroom, a restorative um, person is, is helping to calm them down, is helping them talk through what's going on, what maybe happened at home that set them off and um, has put them in this dysregulated state. So we have restorative classrooms in our district and we're in our second year of having therapeutic classrooms. So that's another level. It's almost like a, a tier three wraparound for the student at that time, um, response time in place uh, when they're having those, those, those issues, those challenges, whether they're withdrawing or whether they're doing it outwardly. So those are some resources that we put into place. Um, again, we realize that's more on the reactive side than on the proactive side. Uh, but we needed to have those things in place so that learning could continue in those classrooms, even when there was disruptive behavior that was present. Uh, the other things that we have challenged ourselves to do um, from K to 12 is we've talked about how when a student gets into a classroom, they may have encountered already four or five staff members before they ever walk into that teacher's classroom. They're encountering a bus driver. They're getting free breakfast. So they're encountering food service personnel. They might be encountering a custodian in the hallway. So they, we need to make sure that we said, it doesn't matter what your role is in this district, you are important to kids. And you need to make sure that when you are seeing kids, you're positively greeting them, you're giving them a smile, asking how they are, because by the time they get to that classroom teacher, they could already have become dysregulated either from something at home or from an encounter that was from another staff member without even realizing it. So being very conscious about reaching out and positively greeting kids um, whether they're in your classroom or not, they're all our kids. And so we all need to make sure that that is a welcoming environment for all of our kids by all of our staff. I would add to that. And just one of the things that we're just starting to do is to think about the kids who are impacted by the kids who are dysregulated and are maybe having a hard time with the not neutral behavior, right? And so when I'm in a classroom over the course of years. So I think Laura earlier talked about that whole idea of toxic stress and um, secondary stress that we all take on. So one of the things that we're noticing is that we talk about secondary stress a lot with our staff, but we're starting to talk about it with our kids too. Kids bring a lot of secondary stress, right? Like um, we have kids every day that talk about the stress that the thought of a school shooting brings to them. And so one of the things that we are think trying out and we're in the beginning stages, so I probably shouldn't even talk about it, especially this publicly. Um, but one of the things that we're really working on is helping kids who are for the most part regulated, but are experiencing humans around them that are dysregulated and then taking in that secondary stress. So for our girls, we're starting to implement a program called ROCKS, Ruling Our Experiences. And it specifically works with girls and their confidence and giving them the advocacy tools that they need to speak up and speak out in situations. And for our boys, we're starting a program called PLAY. It's Preventing Long-Term Anger and Aggression in Youth. And so mm -hmm. we're starting to do some programs for kids who are currently regulated, but thinking about the stress that they take in all the time, because there's not a classroom in America right now that doesn't have at least one kid who's dysregulated on a fairly regular basis. And we've got to name that and we have to start talking about it. And so one of the things that we have to do is take care of the kids and do the things for those kids that are dysregulated, but also what's the return on investment on the other kids in the room and how are we making sure that we're taking care of their mental health and, um, doing things like training kids in teen mental health first aid so that lots of kids also can see signs when other kids are very dysregulated and maybe see things that an adult wouldn't see. So how are we taking care of the other kids as they're taking in um, chronic stress as well and thinking about how we create that overall system of support for all of the kids and all of their families? Wow, thank you for sharing that. Those sound like incredible programs. And I mean, just another example of how much more schools are taking on these days. Um, I, I In terms of student behavior, I, I want to kind of go back to talking about student attendance, too. How do these two ideas intersect? Um, a student who is uh, maybe finding school challenging, of course, probably doesn't want to be there. So can you, can we talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, I, I think it's a reinforcing loop and not in, in a good way. It's a, a, the students that have externalizing behavior will struggle developing peer relationships that are positive and thriving. And students that have internalizing behavior will as well. It's probably a little tougher on the externalizing side because those because students around them begin to feel fearful, you know, in their presence. And it's hard to forget some things that have happened, um, you know, as kids have known each other over the years. So that's one thing. And so both of those um, both of those consequences can lead to students not wanting to be at school anymore. And if they're not at school, then they're not learning. And we all know or could infer that if you're sitting in a space where you feel like you don't know what's going on and you're not really keeping up, the chances of you wanting to come back again and again and again every day are pretty low. So we worry a lot about those students who have internalizing, externalizing behaviors that lead them to um, stop coming to school. And sometimes, um, again, with the notion that maybe we're speaking to a diverse audience, our providers with the best of intentions, be that mental health providers, medical you know, care providers, even might recommend not attending school. Like that seems to be a stressor. Let's give that a rest. And what we would really like to see is more of a partnership on what could we do in the school environment to make sure that the student continues to come to school so that we're actually um, putting them in a realistic environment with the expectations that they uh, will be facing now and forever, and so that they can be appropriately treated by the healthcare professional within that environment in that context. How do you work to support staff who are dealing with, um, who are working with these students, trying to meet these students' needs every day? It's something we work on every day. Yeah. <laughs> It is. I mean, that's a, that's a huge challenge. Um, that's a huge load for for um, for teachers and 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 staff to bear because going through teacher training programs that really was not part of uh, teacher training programs. You know, how do you how do you combat some of the the issues that we see on a daily basis? So we try to um, support as much self care as we can. Um, we try to make sure that we have a, a positive environment for that. Morale is high. Hey, let's cancel a meeting this week. Go fill your cup. Go do something. So, trying to keep the pulse of how are our educators doing um, on a daily or weekly basis, and then making sure that we're there to provide the supports that they need. So, just like we talk to kids about, you know, see something, say something. We need to make sure that our adults feel okay about that as well. That it's not it's not showing weakness if you say, "Hey, I need to tap out for five or ten minutes. Can somebody cover my class?" You know, those types of things that we need to make it safe for them to be able to be vulnerable and to be able to share with us what it is that they need in order to make sure that they are whole in providing what kids need at that time. I think it's important, too, to note staff have not recovered from the pandemic. So we're talking a lot about the fact that kids haven't returned in the ways that they would hope that we would hope that they have returned. And I think it's important that in this session, we name that staff are struggling and they have not recovered from the pandemic um, at this point in the ways that I had hoped that we would have recovered by now. And especially the externalized behaviors that Laura referenced um, before make it very, very challenging for staff. And Sometimes I think that there's a perception, um, you know, to, to Rachel's point, you know, kids need to be in school. I mean, that is a community safety um, commitment, right? My husband is the chief of police in my community, and we talk a lot about that, right? Like, it is very, very important that they're in school. And it's also important that all kids feel safe and feel like they can come to school and learn without kids telling their teachers, telling their teachers off every day or causing so much commotion that it does distract from their ability to gain access to knowledge and to build that community that we talked about. And in 2024, 
we don't have the staff available that we had in 2018. I don't know about other schools, so I'm speaking to my school district. We don't have the staff that we need to take care of the kids. So because we don't have the staff, we're asking an already burnt out staff to do more than they would have done in 2018. And we're asking teachers who are already exhausted to do more because we don't have the humans to help them do the other things that we're asking them to do. And when they're tired and they're exhausted and they're not at their best, then they do things that exhibit their unwellness. And when they do things that exhibit that they're unwell, it makes kids not want to come to school. And so again, it is completing that toxic circle that we have to find ways to combat. And so, you know, again, you know, how we look at school, whether we start to look at school differently, but um, these things are not going to change if we don't start really digging deep into the root causes of what's going on, because there's so many factors at play. And we really have to start thinking about how are we supporting our teachers? Because Aaron's right, they need self-care. I don't know a one of them that has time for self-care. And I honestly feel guilty saying that to them sometimes like, hey, you should take care of yourself. And then they're saying to me, and how am I going to progress monitor all those kids every day then? Tell me how I can do both. And so I do think it's something that we need to look at as a state. Um, what pieces of compliance are driving us that need to be taken off teachers' plates so that they can do the work that we're talking about in this Zoom? Because right now we're just asking them to add on and we're not taking anything away from them. And that's not, help that's not helping the kids who don't want to come to school. And I think it's important that we name that. Having unwell staff is not helping kids get to school. And so that's another piece of this that I think we absolutely have to start digging deep into if we really want to think about becoming that education powerhouse that we once were was in this state, like that has to be a part of the conversation as we move forward. Well, uh, these have been a couple of hard topics, hard conversations. Um, I, I, with our last few minutes here, I wonder if you could share some bright spots that you see in, in your school district. What are you excited about? What are teachers excited about? I'm kind of putting you on the spot there with that question, but. <laughs> wow, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure teachers are actually making the world continue to go around because yeah. like when I think about all that our teachers accomplish in a day, a week, a month, a school year, it, it's, it's just unbelievable. And they do continue to focus on the positives and it is the kids that keep everybody, you know, coming back and just the greater purpose. So we we have so many challenges before us and at the same time we we just have so many talented people um wanting to do the work for the betterment of of Iowa we truly do i mean i don't mean to sound philosophical but mm -hmm. spend a day in a school and see what a teacher accomplishes with a group of somewhere between 16 and 30 kids depending on the grade level and the and the circumstances and it is magical. Despite all of these challenges, the work that our teachers do in schools is unbelievable. In all name, I've never seen school leaders work together like I've seen since the pandemic ended. One thing the pandemic did was it forced us to get together and put our heads together and start to solve problems. I mean, Laura and I are completely across the state from each other, but sit in several similar circles across the year. Um, her district is, a, I actually was on this phone with her superintendent just this morning, um, <laughs> brainstorming a solution to an issue that we have. So it has forced this really cool collaboration across the state. And I think if we were allowed to do great things, I think really powerful things could come out of this state. I would agree. And when I think of the word resilient, I think of the teachers and the administrators. I think about, you know, we learned on a Sunday night that school was closed, right? Nine o'clock on a Sunday night, you're done. And the very next day, all of us were on Zoom or Google Meets with our um, with our building leaders and our district leaders trying to figure this out. And the fact that they could pivot with us and then our teachers pivoted um, all through the pandemic and then came back. I mean, that's a celebration in and of itself is the dedication that I see um, in school with what Laura was describing, just miraculous things and fun things happening in classrooms. You know, we try to highlight those on social media and the teacher's like, well, I don't contact the media specialist to talk about it because I do this every day. 
we know you do, but other people don't know how awesome this is. So we need to tell our stories um, to get that perception of public education to be positive across this state and with our legislators, because there are incredible things going on in our schools and it's our responsibility to tell that story. So we've talked a lot about things that we're working on and, and challenges that we have, but on the flip side, there's so many things to celebrate and, and we need to do a good job statewide telling that story. Well, thank you all. I really appreciated this conversation. Um, that's going to conclude our conversation on student attendance and classroom behavior. Uh, thank you for your questions and for tuning in. And thank you to our panelists for their insight and, and to our presenting sponsor, ITC Midwest. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>